Hi, in a lot of my videos, I speak about the pharmacology of psychedelics at a pretty high level. I wanted to use this video opportunity to make a video to a level in which the general public can understand psychedelics and their mechanism of actions. Here's a little bit of background information about LSD. LSD has this following structure. Outlined in blue is the lysergic acid part of the molecule and outlines in red is the diethylamide part of the molecule. This, of course, is a two-dimensional structure of the drug. If we consider these wedges, the wedges mean something different. Notice the wedge by the hydrogen. The wedge by the hydrogen means that the hydrogen is coming out of the page, coming towards us in three-dimensional space. You also notice another wedge. The other wedge is located by the carbon double bonded to the oxygen, which also means that this carbon is coming out of the page towards us. Let's look at that in three-dimensional space. Here's the LSD molecule in a three-dimensional space. If we spin it 90 degrees, we can see that hydrogen that is in a wedge conformation is coming out towards us into the page. Also, the other carbon that has a wedge is coming out towards us in the page. We'll also notice that the diethyl amide groups at the top connected to the blue nitrogen are pointing in the opposite orientation of each other. If we spin it another 180 degrees, we can see the molecule from the other side. And then if we spin it 90 degrees, we can go back to the original starting position of the molecule. I want to talk about more background information of LSD. This time in pink, I have something different outlined in the structure. This thing outlined in pink is called the tryptamine backbone. Back when people were trying to figure out the mechanism of action of LSD, they had this simple realization that a neurotransmitter in our brain also has a tryptamine backbone. This is the neurotransmitter serotonin. They figured, well, if LSD has a similar scaffold or structure as serotonin, it probably also has a similar mechanism of action as serotonin, which we now know it does, binding to the serotonin receptor. Another compound that has this scaffold is psilocin, which is a compound that occurs in psilocybin or psychedelic mushrooms. It also has a tryptamine backbone. Notice the different structural features of serotonin versus psilocin. The position of the alcohol group is one carbon difference. And where serotonin has two hydrogens, psilocin has two methyl groups. I want to use a simple analogy to explain drugs and receptors with the following. Imagine if I have a baseball glove and a baseball. In this analogy, the receptor is going to be represented by a baseball glove, and a drug is going to be represented by a baseball. In this state, the drug is unbound to the receptor, i.e. the baseball is not inside of the baseball glove. In order for a drug to have a pharmacological effect, the drug has to be bound to the receptor, or the baseball has to be inside of the baseball glove. Without the baseball inside of the baseball glove, a pharmacological effect will not occur and an intoxication will not be produced. Although a baseball glove is a great analogy to explain how a receptor works and what it looks like, it doesn't look like a baseball glove. Here's what it actually looks like. If you're very confused, that's totally okay. So what is this really? This receptor represented by different colors is actually just really a collection of one of the 20 amino acids at every position. Specifically, this receptor is a serotonin 2B receptor, which we'll discuss a little bit later. If we spin the receptor around in 360 degrees, we can see all the different amino acids that make up the specific receptor. There's a simpler way to look at receptors. These structures that look like spaghetti noodles are called alpha helices, and biochemists often use them to look at receptors in a much simpler way. 
Note that the two pictures are of the same thing. They are just two different representations of the same thing. And the one on the right is a little bit easier to understand. Let's now look at the reality of drug receptor binding. But keep in your mind the analogy of the baseball and the baseball glove, as it is very useful. We said that this was the serotonin 2B receptor, or the baseball glove, and our drugs are baseballs. In this case, we have LSD, we have psilocin, and we have serotonin. Note that these drugs are not bound to the receptor yet, so they cannot have a pharmacological action. One of the questions that scientists like to ask, and I'm very curious about, is in terms of this receptor and in terms of these drugs, where exactly does the drug bind to on the receptor? It's basically a really complicated baseball glove, and there are many different places within the pocket that a drug can bind to on a receptor. Now that we've talked a little bit about receptors, let's take a deeper dive into serotonin 2B receptor with LSD bound to it and what that looks like. So first off, this is the serotonin 2B receptor that we've been looking at. Each of these spaghetti noodle things, it does have a name to it. The one in red is called transmembrane helix number one. In orange is called transmembrane helix number two. In yellow is helix number three. And this darker green is helix number four and this much prettier green is helix number five. And then if we spin the receptor 180 degrees, we can see helix number six and helix number seven. Now here's that same receptor with LSD bound to it. The LSD molecule is in this light blue color with these white balls on it that are hydrogen atoms. And if we spin the receptor, we can see a much better view of the drug sitting inside of the receptor from the back. And then we can spin it to its original position to see how it sits inside of the receptor. This is a slightly different representation of the LSD molecule inside of serotonin 2B receptor. In this view, we can see every atom of the LSD molecule that we couldn't see before. Let's now see what it looks like inside the receptor from the top down. Here's where the drug sits inside the receptor. We'll talk about the implications of this in the next slide. You might be wondering now, how do drugs and receptors interact in such a way that a drug gets held inside of a receptor? Because in reality, that is what happens. There's a special type of bond that occurs between LSD and the receptor. This amino acid right here is called glycine. What happens is this bond called a hydrogen bond forms between the white hydrogen and the red oxygen. And there's a dashed line to show the bond. Specifically in this case, hydrogen is positively charged and oxygen is negatively charged. And in chemistry, a positive charge and a negative charge interact to suck each other towards them. Similarly, aspartic acid 135 helps hold part of the LSD molecule inside the receptor. It's the same situation where the hydrogen is positively charged and the oxygen is negatively charged. And this works kind of like a magnet holding a drug inside of a receptor. We just talked about the idea that LSD has a hydrogen bond with aspartic acid 135 and glycine 221. More interactions between drugs and receptors create stronger interactions and less interactions between a drug and a receptor will create a weaker interaction. There's actually a standardized way in which we can measure the strength in which a drug binds to a receptor. The term for this is affinity. Let's use a simple example to try and explain this further. I remember as a kid playing with these toys. It is a Velcro surface, and if you throw a tennis ball at it, it sticks to it very well. 
you have to use force to rip the tennis ball away from the Velcro surface. In this case, we would say the tennis ball sticks well to the surface. We would call this a high affinity interaction, much like a drug being the tennis ball and the Velcro surface being the receptor. These have good stickiness towards each other and they will interact to a stronger degree. On the other hand, let's look at a tennis racket and a tennis ball. No matter how hard or weak you throw a tennis ball at a tennis racket, the ball is going to bounce off of the racket. There's not much, there's not a long period of time where the tennis ball will interact with the racket. It will bounce off pretty much right away. We would say that these have a low affinity interaction. They don't interact for a long period of time. You can use this idea in pharmacology to actually measure the affinity between a drug and a receptor. I'm not going to explain how the assay works, I just want to teach you how to read this and interpret data. What they have done here in this specific assay is they have measured a different uh, drugs or compounds that bind to serotonin receptors. Let's just consider LSD. In the columns going vertical, these are different subtypes of serotonin receptors. Serotonin has many different subtypes of receptor. At the 1A receptor, they just give us a value or a number to tell us how strong the drug interacts with the receptor. All you really need to know is that the smaller the value or closer to zero this number is, the stronger the interaction between the drug being LSD and the receptor. If we go across the board and look at LSD's interacting energies or affinity values, we would see that the one highlighted in purple is the strongest interaction or the one closest to zero. So we would say that LSD out of all these receptor subtypes has the strongest affinity at the serotonin 2A receptor.